I'm from the Town and Country Planning Association, which is England or Britain's oldest um, charity that campaigns for housing and the environment. Um, it was set up at the end of the 19th century, and I'll say a little bit more about that in a minute. Um, but what we're interested in is the outcomes of the planning system. What does it do? What does it create? And how does it impact on people's lives? And the TCPA works in particular um, for what we'd like to see, which is a good, affordable home for everybody in a really good environment. The roots of the TCPA and the roots of planning um, come from the 19th century. In the 19th century, there was no planning system. You could just build what you wanted if you had enough money and you just built it. And as many of you know, the, as a result of the Industrial Revolution, our cities grew incredibly quickly with no planning, just houses piled on houses, and created for many people really awful living conditions. Um, they were overcrowded, polluted, um, uh, dreadful, dreadful places to live. Despite that, people kept flocking from the countryside to the cities, and that was because in the city, despite the awful living conditions, there were lots of jobs. They were generally much better paid jobs than people had been used to. There was a lot going on, there were people, there were things happening, um, and there were opportunities. In contrast, the countryside, although it was green and pleasant and was a place where you could get fresh air and you could grow your own food, there was often very, very little employment, the pay was dire, and people were often very isolated. So despite the awfulness of the cities, people continued to flock to them because they did offer some advantages over the countryside. By the end of the 19th century, um, many radical thinkers and progressive people were realising that there was a very strong link between the places where people lived and the quality of their lives and their health. And through a number of um, well-known projects, um, that what emerged and eventually became the planning system and the public health profession came out of the roots of looking at the links between the quality of people's lives and social justice and the places in which they lived. And a number of those radical thinkers of the late 19th century started to think, well, perhaps you could take the very best bits of the countryside, the fresh air, the green spaces, and the opportunities to grow your own food, and mix that with the really good things about the cities. The, the jobs, the social life, the cultural life. And out of that came um, the Garden City movement, which was um, led by Ebenezer Howard, who went on to set up what's now the TCPA. And not only did they have these very good ideas and decide for the first time, or um, uh, for the first time for many years, that we should actually plan brand new places that brought together the, the best of the countryside and the best of the cities, they actually went out and did this. They, um, well, Howard in particular, um, went and um, bought some land. He had to borrow the money off friends. Um, I hope he kept his friends, but anyway, he, he sort of catched the money, bought some land in Hertfordshire, and they went out and they built Letchworth, which was the first garden city. And since then, planning has, in many respects, made a fantastic difference to many, many people's lives. And I think that's often neglected because it has also made some mistakes. But if you look at many of the achievements in, in better housing in the 20th century, that sprung out of a planning system which had a focus on social justice. And the TCPA today still campaigns for a new generation of garden cities. And um, what you see in the picture here is Letchworth. Uh, and I'd just like to clarify that what we're campaigning for is not for lots of pastiche replicas of Letchworth to be scattered around the country. The brilliant thing about Letchworth was it was the cutting edge for its time. It was the best architecture, the best landscape design of the time. And that's the essence of garden cities. It's not about an oldie worldy twee thing from the past. It's about creating high quality places for people using the best architecture, the best landscape. And the things that the planning system helped deliver in terms of better housing continued for decades through the 20th century. I think it's really easy to forget quite how awful the living conditions that many, many people suffered were right up until relatively recently. And any of you who've read Alan Johnson's book about his childhood and his very vivid descriptions of growing up in condemned housing in London, I think will be shocked at how you know, within, within people's lifetimes, um, the terrible, terrible conditions that many people are living in. And I think it's just easy to forget that. And to look at some of the houses and flats that replaced 
those condemned buildings and say, well, you know, they're not that good, they could be better. Well, yes, they could. Looking back, you know, with 50 years of history, we can look back and say they could be better. But at the time, for many people, they represented a fantastic transformation in living conditions. And the TCPA is doing a huge bit of research to look at the new towns that were built after the war and to try and reassess them and find out what they did achieve and what they didn't achieve, what worked and what didn't, and why did some aspects work and some didn't. Some of the reasons some of them haven't done so well were very much to do with that post-war environment. Um, there were very few building materials after the war, so some of them were built with really flimsy materials. They got very dilapidated and they never had enough investment to bring them up to a better standard. Um, equally, I think the impact of the car on post-war planning and design was hugely disruptive um, and we've ended up with some places that are very dominated by a car way of thinking, which sometimes works and sometimes didn't. So there were some, some things that went wrong that were perhaps very specific to that point in the 20th century. Looking forward, um, it's highly likely that there will be a new generation of large-scale developments. At the TCPA, we think the Garden City model still has a huge amount to offer because of its wonderful mixture of high-quality landscape and housing and culture. Um, there are also very interesting financial mechanisms. The new towns, um, the money to build the new towns was lent by the Treasury. It was all paid back. So it's an investment. It's not a grant that disappears. Um, and it's highly likely with all three political parties, major political parties committed to a new generation of new towns that there, and garden cities, that there will be some more. So we're doing research to find out what worked, what didn't and what we can learn for the next time round. Garden cities have always been a very radical idea and they've always had a very strong focus on social justice. They've always been about creating places in which everyone can thrive. And we think that message is still extremely important. It's not about creating places for the few, it's about places for everybody. If you look on our website, there's a lot more specific stuff about the ingredients of a garden city. I've put a few things up there. Um, but the strong sense of social justice that's run through right from the beginning is still very much part of um, what we think garden cities should be about. So what about the planning system? It's now sort of 100 years old, um, and it came from this very... Um, radical idea of social justice, of creating better places for everybody. And where is it today? Well, uh, during the 20th century, um, quite a lot of the focus on social justice sort of got whittled away and a bit diluted, and it sort of fizzled out a bit. Today, if you read statements about what the planning system's for, they'll often say it's to create more jobs or investment or economy, all of which is really important. But words such as social justice or equality of outcome have gradually disappeared. If you look at the National Planning Policy Framework, which is the planning document, planning policy document, whereas previous iterations often referred to equality of outcomes, it's now much more about well-being. The word equality isn't in the MPPF. Well-being, I think, is in there three times. Somebody said to me recently, well, equality is a bit of an old-fashioned word. It sounds a bit like the 1970s, and well-being is much more modern. Well-being is what people want. And I completely understand that, but there is an important difference. And the difference is you can measure equality. You can pin it down. You can measure it. You can plot whether it's going up or down. Well-being is far more nebulous. You can argue about what exactly it is. Does somebody have it or not? Do you measure it this way or that way? and it becomes much muddier, much harder to talk about. Um, Oxfam recently came out with a very shocking statistic that there are 80 people in the world who own as much as half of the population in the world. You can only have those sort of statistics if you've got numbers in there. If it's all a bit wishy-washy and nebulous, you can't come out with that sort of thing, and it's much harder to track, much harder to see what's going on. So, well... You might think that not talking about equality and talking about well-being is just sort of modern and, and sounds better. I think there's a real reason to start thinking about equality and does the planning system, should the planning system deliver equality or help to deliver equality or not? The TCPA a couple of years ago did um, a piece of research looking at the impact <coughs> of the decisions that planners make on people's lives. And despite the fact that the planning system has become much more, in many cases, arguably focused on processes and bureaucracy and much less interested in creating wonderful places, the decisions that planners make still have a huge impact on people's lives, particularly in um, deprived areas. 
And um, I won't go into all the details, the, the report's on our website, but there, there are some quite profound implications of quite simple decisions that planners do or don't make. But one of the key recommendations of the report was that the National Planning Policy Framework should prioritise poverty reduction. Um, and this is the sort of environment that some people are growing up with. And as, you know, given, this, um, given the audience that you are, I'm sure many of you are very familiar with the huge amount of information about the impact on people's physical health, on their mental health, on their sense of um, empowerment, what they can and can't do, of growing up in um, very poor quality environments. There's a huge amount of research out there. I'm not going to go through it, but it does have an effect on people. And it has an effect that the rest of society sort of has to pick up later. At the TCPA, we think it's time to rethink the social purpose of planning. Planning was about creating better places, about social justice, about equality, and it isn't really anymore. It sort of got lost. We think it's time to put it back there. We hope that other people also think this. Um, we're very pleased that we've just heard that the Webb Memorial Trust, who funded our work, um, the research into the Planning Out Poverty Report, have now agreed to fund us to start a major project looking at how we can get um, social justice back into the planning system. We're, we're, it's such a new project, we've only just heard we've got the funding, we haven't even got a name for it yet, but we will be talking about it um, to an awful lot of people and organisations, including professional institutes, we'll be talking to the Landscape Institute about it, but we'll also be talking to the public, because we think that although the planning system and design can't solve poverty, without thinking about planning and design, you really won't get very far. They're fundamental to the places in which we live. And if we're going to create better places, if we're going to start to um, help people get out of poverty, we've got to include planning and design.